Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with the Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Poets Respond Live, the only Sunday morning talk show dedicated to exploring current events through the lens of poetry. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. If it's morning for you, if it's afternoon, wherever you are, um, thanks so much for joining us. It's really fun to do these every Sunday. Um, this is primarily an open mic for poems about current events. So if you have any poems like that, um, all you have to do is um, uh, send it over email to openmic at rattle.com if you haven't submitted it to um, to Rattle yet. Uh, you can also, if you submitted it this week to Submittable, though, um, then I can pull it up there. But if you haven't, you can still send it to openmic at rattle.com. And then all you do is call me up over Skype. Uh, my Skype ID is Rattle Poetry. And the phone number is 818-850-7727 if you don't use Skype. Um, if you call by phone, just let it ring a few times, and then I will call you back when the time is right. Um, um, you know, when you call in, it leaves you on a call list, kind of, and I just go back in the order they were received. So, so let me know. Sort of sign up right now by calling or sending me a chat message uh, through Skype or the regular phone. Now, um, before forgetting, I should also say... That uh, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We are entirely independent and do this because we love poetry. We hope you do too. If you do, please click the like button and share and subscribe wherever you're watching this. This is streaming on um, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitter. Wherever you are, if you're seeing this for the first time, make sure you're subscribed and click on something to let the computers know that you like it. That's always good for us. Um, that's all we ask. We never take donations, really. All we do is share poetry, and because um, we love it, and we love hearing stories told this way, and uh, we hope you do too. Now, um, I'm going to call up first um, uh, Saturday's poet, um, Wendy Manukin, um, and her poem, uh, "Writing Poems on Zoom with My Grandchildren," was a a really touching um, poem that turned. Um, turned really moving too at the same time about the effect of uh, the coronavirus has on on kids and our family relationships let's call wendy up right now um hey wendy let me uh shut off your youtube stream i forgot to warn you about that can you hear me hey wendy uh, let me pull you in I can't hear you is the only problem. You, you can't hear me? We can, huh. we can hear you. I'll turn on. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I can mm. hear you through the, um, through the YouTube. Uh, It'll work there, out. There's a big delay, so that wouldn't work. Um, work. No, but I think you're hearing me through this. So just shut off your YouTube, and, and you should be okay. good. See if you can... Okay, how are we now? We're good now, yeah. So, um, hello, Wendy, good to see you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so, is there anything you want to say about your, your poem that you we published yesterday? Well, um, the poem that you published is about uh, trying to find a way to stay connected with my grandchildren during the pandemic. And one of the ways that we found was that I would meet with each of the grandchildren, the older grandchildren, we have four, and the older ones are eight, eight, and 10. And I would meet with them individually for a half an hour twice a week. And we would write poems together. And this was a little bit of a help to the parents, because as we know, parents with children at home and jobs are having a really difficult time. So I thought, great, this will be a help for them. I'll love it. I'll stay connected. I did love it. It was a way to stay connected. It was much harder than I thought. <laughs> because I've never really taught poetry to an eight-year-old for a whole half hour. I mean, usually it's a classroom if I'm teaching younger kids, and they interact with each other. Now it was just interacting with me. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a little a bit of the background of uh, what the poem is about. And then... Um, it was interesting to me that when this whole pandemic and self-isolation started, I found it very difficult to write. And I think that one of the reasons is that my poetry tends to be very family focused. And I try to put together different moments that I observe or participate in. 
and collage them together to make something that's meaningful to me. But I don't have a lot of um, declarations. I don't have a large view of the world. Um, I don't like to declaim. I don't feel I have that voice. So I was kind of silenced for months because I felt that my family-focused poems were not sufficient to the times. And um, then I just really missed writing. <laughs> so I managed to start in again. And this is one of the um, first poems that I managed to put together when I started writing again. Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's a sweet poem. And, um, and then it turns into a really sort of a moving poem about the way children are dealing with this, which and, and as you talk, I, I can relate to so much of what you're talking about, because we have two kids, ours are six and ten. And we're, we work from home anyway. And um, so juggling that and trying to keep, I just feel so terrible for them, how little interaction they get with other kids. And um, just the, the, the social, the lack of socialization is, is just really tough um, to know even what to do or how to handle it. And then, um, but then that last line, you, you know, you turn that personal into something that's just so much bigger, which is how, um, how kids are, are understanding what's going on, I think, too. Yeah, I really feel that often things happen with my grandchildren um, that just seem, you know, they just happen and they go into the whole, you know, mess of everything that's happened. And then later I kind of think, whoa, you know, um, that's kind of unusual or that surprised me. Um, and so it's it also because I think kids speak in a very real way. They're not, um, they don't, uh take their comments and filter them through any criticism or usually mm -hmm. that they feel they're going to get. And so I feel like when adults talk about some of these issues, we have a lot of different filters on. They might be political, they might be familiar. But the kids, especially after I would be with them for 20 minutes or something, would really just start talking about their inner lives, even if it wasn't in a way that re they recognized they were doing. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. I don't know if you know about our the Rattle Young Poets Anthology. I wanted to make sure you did, though, so you can uh, have your kids oh. send that in. But we do that once a year. Did you know about that? No. Uh, yeah, so it, it comes with a summer issue. And actually, since we published your poem, you're going to get that in the mail, so you'll see oh. it. Um, early on, it was um, much younger kids. Um, they were sort of between the ages maybe 5 and 12 was the average age of the first couple of years. Lately, the older teenagers have been taking it over, but it's kids up to 15. And um, I think as like high school teachers got to learn about it, they tell their students to submit. And then we have just mountains of submissions from 15-year-olds now. But um, for younger kids, it's amazing to see um, just all that they, they pull in. You know, there's so many they see the whole world. It's not like, um, you know, you, you, they don't, you don't hide things from them. They know what's going on. So. And also um, now that you're saying that it was also interesting to me that I, um, I do know Kenneth Koch's work on teaching poetry to children. Yeah. So he's a big um, believer in, you know, teaching great poems to children as opposed to working on, you know, teaching children's poems to ch children. So what we did each week is we picked um, a poem like by, started out with William Blake's Tiger, Tiger, you know, and um, we did poems by Emily Dickinson and um, Billy Collins and Emily Dickinson, unless I said that already. And um, what was really interesting to me, I thought, now I'm going to really have to struggle to get this poem across to these kids. Nope. Like, you know, I we'd read Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, and then I'd say, okay, now what we're going to do? And I said, hey, no, 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 I get it. And they'd write their own, you know, poem. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how I think we sometimes think kids um, need poetry specially geared to them when they're just a sponge for good poetry. Yeah, they really are. I, I taught a few summers. We couldn't do it this summer because of um, the virus, but we had there was a summer camp where kids would have classes in like cooking and and theater and things like that. And so I did the poetry thing in our town and uh, for a few summers and. And it was the same thing. We would, I would read some, you know, actually really good haiku by Basso or Isa, or I would read uh, Frost to teach them a bit about rhyme, or, or you know, but real poems. Um, and 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 the only thing that was a struggle, which maybe you can relate to, was the age differences for what they were writing. Like the, you know, the younger kids, because it would be anybody from like six to like fourteen or something. And the yeah, yeah, and so the the level of what they could do with the writing, like the the younger kids would be done with the prompt poem that we would end up working on after a few minutes. Their you know their, their attention spans are not that long, but um, but it was a wonderful thing. So I just want to everybody who's watching this, I, I you know follow Wendy's um um 
pattern here and and if you can teach your teach your grandchildren uh poetry if if um you know it really helps the parents out like you said i think it helps the kids out and it helps spread poetry and um and then have them submit to uh the rattle young poets anthology which will come out again next next summer and the name of that book um i think is i don't have it right here i have it in the room i used to teach the kids um teaching great poetry to children i think it's called and it has some if you're kind of nervous about getting started with kids it has great ideas of how to present and specific poem examples. The difference is that he was teaching in a classroom. And if you're teaching one-on-one -on -one with your grandchildren, you have to remember that a half an hour is a long time <laughs> yeah. to keep your kids interest. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing all this, Wendy. Do you wanna read the poem now? I'll, I'll put it up on screen, but you have to find your own copy. I have my okay. own copy, yeah. Okay. Writing odes with the grandchildren. Oh. That's fine, except that's the earlier version. So we'll just get a different one. Writing poems on Zoom with my grandchildren. Lucy prefers cardboard and crayons, scissors and glue. She loves decorating a poetry box, but she's not so crazy about writing. She makes faces at the screen, adds emojis, while I explain an ode is a poem of praise. Pablo Neruda wrote an ode to tomatoes. He wrote an ode to bicycles. Okay, okay, she says, pasting a smile on the screen. She'll write about crossing night. At crossing night, we stopped cars so salamanders could cross the road. She taps her pencil. It was raining. She taps her pencil. Now can I draw a picture? Max yawns into the screen, insists he's not tired. Bored, maybe? Something you love, I say. Baseball? Minecraft? Star Wars? He gives a sigh. Blue, he says, the old dog who's going blind and deaf. Sometimes when I lie down next to her to scratch her ears, she doesn't know it's me. Max looks into the corner of the screen as if the next words might appear there. Sometimes she growls. He rocks a little in his chair. I have to learn to be careful. Eliza needs no prompting. She's going to write. You know what? This is also an earlier um, draft, but you'll get to hear the early. Uh, okay. Eliza starts in so quickly, I wonder if she's heard me. You're writing an ode, I say. She nods. What are you praising? She holds the poem out to me. Antibodies. Thanks so much. <laughs> Guys, I have, I have like five versions of the poem, <laughs> and I thought I pulled up the right one, but... <laughs> Well, it's, right on the screen. It did, yeah, and and I have to follow this too because as you were reading, I um I had too many windows open, I couldn't find the actual poem for a while, so it took me. So we were both kind of fumbling around a little bit, but it was a exactly yeah. But it's a it's a wonderful poem. Um, thanks so much for sharing and reading it, Wendy, and for joining us today. Okay, I'll look forward to that anthology. Yeah, yeah, it's coming in the mail. Good. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was uh, Wendy Manukin. Uh, with her poem, once again, writing poems on Zoom with my grandchildren. And the other, that was Saturday's poem. Um, and today's poem uh, was by Jennifer Reeser. And I, I couldn't get a hold of her, so I'm not sure. Um, let's see, let me make sure she didn't email back yet. Yeah, she didn't reply to the email yet. But um, let's see. So... So we'll have to have, we'll have to play her poem, but um, this was a poem. Um, let me show it for you. There was a scientist panicked by vanishing star, and if you're wondering what the form is, it's a triolet. Um, so you see the the first and the second line become refrains. The uh, second line is repeated on line. I can't remember which how it goes. Line what is it? Line eight. No, the first. Yeah, Leah, line one repeats in line five and then line seven. And that's what makes it a triolet. And it's about this new story. Um, I wonder if the um, distant star vanishes without a trace and panicked scientists don't know 
where it went, which is kind of, I mean, a little bit melodramatic. I don't think the scientists are actually panicking over <laughs> this missing star, but it is an amazing mystery. And there's so many mysteries in um, astronomy. Um, there's the fast radio bursts. There's the micronova repeaters. There's Tabby Star. And the cool thing about um, astronomy, or maybe the, I don't know if cool is the right word, but one of the things I love about it is that there's so little um, telescope time. Um, you know, first of all, the Earth has to swing around the right direction to even be able to see some of these things that you want to explore. And then, um, you know, every all the astronomers in the world are, are um, vying for time on these telescopes. So mysteries kind of linger for years, like that Tabby Star, which has um, something... Fly, sir, orbiting it that's the size of like another star but black is uh you know not emitting light um it's very strange and who knows what that is and uh, this is another similar strange story the star vanished without a trace and um, they looked at it in 2011 and it was there and they looked at it in 2019 and it was gone and um you know if it, if it had nova it should be a bright nebula and if it and if it was turning into a black hole and collapsing, it would release um, radio waves, and it would be a long, slow process too. Uh, there'd be remnants of it. So the fact that it just disappeared is a huge mystery, and um, fascinating. So um, here is Jennifer Reeser's triolet on the topic: uh, scientists panicked by vanished star. Oop, hang on. Get the right microphone for you. Here we go. Scientists panicked by vanished star. A massive star without a trace has died away, as most things must. No fond farewell for us from space. A massive star without a trace distills the skill to self efface black hole dimmed in a cloud of dust a massive star without a trace has died away as most things must so a wonderful triolet there by jennifer reeser and um you know, we there, we receive so few, you know, formal poems that I just love when we get a good one. And um, it's really hard to pass. Uh, but we had a lot of great poems this week. It was an amazing week of poetry. We um, um, we only had, we're, we're sort of down to regular levels after the big peak from the pandemic of submissions. I think we were down to like 250, maybe 300 submissions. Whereas um, during the height of the quarantine where everybody was locked down and freaking out about the uh, coronavirus, um, we were getting like a thousand a week, uh, but the poems were, there was just a lot. It was really hard to figure out which poem to publish. And, and we decided, or I decided, um, actually I, I had to enlist Megan's help and she decided she liked them all too. So we actually picked four poems this week and uh, we had the two this weekend that we're going to have two, one Tuesday and one Thursday. And um, because why not? More poetry, the better. Now, a whole bunch of people have asked and called in already. Um, so I'm sure we're going to fill up this the rest of this 40 minutes. Uh, thanks so much to everybody for uh, doing that. But if you still want to, feel free to let me throw this up on the screen one more time. Um, the, you can email your poem to openmic at rattle.com. And you can call. Um, if you do that, um, then I can show the poem on the screen as you read if it's new and you haven't submitted it. If you submitted it, I can just pull up from submittable. Um, and, and then if you'd like to read it, um, you just send me a chat message over Skype to Rattle Poetry, all one word, or um, you can call on the phone, 818-850-7727, let it ring a few times, and then um, I will call you back when the timing is right. Now, who is the first? So John Sweeter was the first person to ask on, and I should say, um, let me see. Um, if I call you, make sure you shut off your YouTube stream because there's a delay and it'll be confusing otherwise. Um, it's, it's like the if you call on a radio talk show or something, uh, there's like a 30 second delay. So you'll hear yourself and me from the past. It'll be very confusing. So shut off your YouTube when I call you, whether that whether that's the phone or the uh, Skype. Um, let's see. John's not answering. What if he's still there. What? No answer. We'll try him again. 
in a minute. Let's go to who will be next. Um, Bill Friedman is next on the list. Hey, Bill, how you doing? <laughs> Cannot figure out how to find you. I okay. am sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you um, so so you're we're talking over Skype, which is the phone. Uh, you know the way the phone connects. Oops, hang on a second. And um, and so these actually stream on either Facebook or YouTube. Um, so all you do is go to um, if you go to rattle.com. And you, after we're done talking, um, and then there, up, up on the upper right, there's some icons for our social media. Either click on the YouTube icon or click on the um, uh, Facebook. And either way, you'll see it at the top because it's the most recent thing if you do it right after. Uh, and then you can watch the rest of the show there. Yeah. You mean uh, retrospectively? I can see it yeah, after Yeah, you can watch finished. it live too. Um, but um, yeah, but it's not live on Skype because I think people get confused because because Zoom and Skype are very different in the way they run. So Skype is just a one on one phone call, um, yeah. and so so there's no like one link All to right. get to it. Okay. But uh, but if you go to our YouTube or Facebook page, you'll see okay. you'll see everybody who already read and and, uh, and yourself yeah. too. Yeah. Okay, I'm not on Facebook, but I can Perfect. try yeah, the YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So so do you, what do you have for us? Okay. All right, I'll try. Well, it's a poem called In Amber, and it's uh, after an article that was in the paper uh, here about the discovery of an iridescent Cretaceous insect, sort of a, a wasp, a magnificently colored, iridescent, green, orange, red, yellow, blue, really spectacular <clears throat> looking insect that was found in amber uh, from uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the poem is called In Amber. And it's about, you know, being caught in amber. And, um, uh, well, it's about, you know, why anybody or why the insect would want to be caught in amber. What's the advantage of it? And the poem, I changed one or two words in it, but the poem at the end takes a kind of an ugly twist. It has a uh, autobiographical reference uh, of an unpleasant event. Yeah, very but, cool. Okay. And, I, and I, thanks for okay. sending the uh, so, newspaper article, the scan of it. I put that on screen so people could could see iridescent insects from Cretaceous found in amber. Yeah, I love poems that are based in, in science. That's kind of my favorite. When, when we started Poets Respond, I was hoping we'd get a lot of those, and um, and it's always fun to see them. So um, yeah, so ready to go with the poem whenever uh, whenever you want. Okay, I've got old poems on quantum and all of that stuff. I love contemporary physics, you know, relativity and quantum, so I've got some of those. Anyway, okay, here's the poem. It's called In Amber, and it goes like this. I hope it's followable. I hope it's not too confusing. In Amber. How clever of Cretaceous insects to choose amber for a home. Not only for the early evening color, dusk, the hint of honey, sweetness, the hero's silent cut-jawed hardness you know is soft inside, that it's rosin for the cello bow, the dust a little like our own that sings. Most, I think, for how it holds its bounty, centered like a wonder, suspended at the far edge of belief, elevates it for inspection like a jewel. Does the wasp or beetle know this when it lets the vague mind wander, steps inside, picture or imagine it as the hung man did who left a neatly scripted notice on the door to call his son? Ooh, wow. Well, thanks for sharing that, Bill. That was Bill Friedman yeah. uh, with his poem, In Amber. A very elegant poem, Bill. I always love the way you write and read. Thanks so much for joining us uh, from Israel. And uh, yeah, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing fine. Thanks. Yeah, hope we are, you definitely. are as well. Thanks so much, Bill. You too. Take Bye. good care, Jim. All the best. Okay. Let's see. So that was William Friedman. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to try, let's see. Let's see, we'll try John Sweeter again. Mm. 
We'll see if it works. If not, we'll call him on the regular phone. Let's see. John, you there? I'm here. Yeah. I'm. Uh, forgive me. I, I'm still learning how this all operates. I'm actually. I see you. I'm on YouTube. I wish I could do the video with you. Actually. Yeah. Actually. Um. So if you're on YouTube, shut that off first, so there's no echo. I don't. I don't hear anything right now. Um. And so just Skype's open, and then um, after that, to get on screen yourself, the camera button is between the red button that hangs up and the microphone icon, which mutes. Yeah. There, here you come. There you go. You see me? Um, not yet. Actually, it's just black. <laughs> black, how about now? Ha, here you go. Yeah, we see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, John Sweeter, thanks so much for joining us. Um, sure. Yeah, so we figured it all out. I'm so glad it worked. Um, Me too. So where are you calling from? Um, Ocean City, New Jersey. Ah, and, and how are things doing there? Things are doing well. Uh, um, uh, um, the weather, well, it's very hot right now. But uh, I have to say, things are going uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm a little distracted now because I inadvertently clicked off my poem that I wanted to read to you. Uh, but but uh, now the weather the weather is perfect. This is a great place to be at this time of the year. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, why don't you find that poem again and then you can read it? Because I can't show it to you. You're going to have to find it yourself. But uh, Sure. Yeah. Uh, it'll just take me a moment. Yeah, yeah no problem at all. Patient. Yeah, and I should say, uh, while, you're, while you're doing that, I'll just remind everybody that if you want to join in, we have a whole list of people lined up to uh, join us. Uh, Chris Kleinfelter, Alira Pass, a bunch of phone numbers, 203-805-281-256, Angela Gartner. So we have a bunch of people, but if you'd like to join in, uh, you can send your poem to openmic at rattle.com if you haven't submitted it, and uh, send me a chat message at Rattle Poetry or... Um, Eight one eight eight five zero seven seven two seven. So, anyway, John, you get the poem ready. I'm all set. Okay, and, and what was it about? Um, well, this is about um, what I call the season of silence. Um, how not just me, but a lot of my friends um, from all over uh, miss not being able to go to uh, to physically attend sporting events. And um, uh, what triggered this poem was actually last Saturday, I was part of a, uh, an annual uh, poetry marathon. It's a 24-hour marathon. Um, people who do write poetry, I think, are well aware of this. It's an online site that has been sponsored for several years. It was away for a few years, but it came back. I, I physically can't do 24 hours any longer, so I do the half marathon. Mm -hmm. And so it's a poem an hour for 12 hours. So um, sometimes uh, I get lucky uh, and uh, a poem comes out that I'm happy with and sometimes not so. But what I found interesting is, is uh, I put these poems aside and let them incubate for sometimes months and come back to them. And sometimes they evolve into uh, a poem that, that, uh, that I might even get published. So uh, I, I like the experience of, of uh, entering that world. Uh, for me, it's a challenge. I'm now 71 years old. So, so staying up 12 hours in a row is not that easy for me. But, but nonetheless, I, I, I do enjoy it. Yeah, that, that, you know, um, I'm actually not familiar yeah. with that, and it sounds like a lot of fun. So I'll have to check that out and, and hope okay. everybody watching does too. That's really cool. It's, this, this, it's worldwide. And if I remember right, I'm not probably getting the number exactly, but this year there were about 240 people all over the mm -hmm. world who were experiencing it. I don't know how many did the half marathon or the full marathon. But um, it's, it's, I think if you Google it, yeah, you'll be I'm able sure. to look Yeah, it, yeah, know. that's cool. Um, yeah, so, so your, your poem is Season of Silence about the silence, and, and that's something that I, I feel too. I, I'm a big sports fan, and not having baseball is such a, a loss for just like entertainment or something. I always have baseball games in the background for three hours a day while I work, and uh, yes. they're gone now, and, and, and yeah. Um, anyway, it's, I'm surprised how much I, I missed it. I, my wife and I would go to maybe – during a full season of uh, up from where uh, my home team is the Philadelphia Phillies, then I would go maybe once every month. So maybe we'd see five games during the course of the season. Um, but that's gone mm -hmm. now. And, and uh, I'm surprised at how much it has actually affected me. Uh, and so and I don't consider myself a, a rabid sports fan by any means. But nonetheless, it was just part of my life that seemed to be uh, – that I've lost temporarily. Yeah, anyway. 
Well, yeah, yeah I definitely so, feel you. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and so, read it, the poem? Sure. Okay. Sure. Season of the Silence. I hear the silence of the fans in the parks, in the arenas, in the stadiums. I hear the silence of the owners and the athletes as they weigh their options. I hear the silence of the season that begins late and finishes early, the televised season. I hear the silence of the virus assessing the behaviors of the fans and the owners and the athletes. Thanks so much. And again, that was John Sweeter reading Seasons of Silence. Do you think we're going to get any baseball or football this year, John? Football, yes. Baseball, yeah, no. yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of doubtful. <laughs> and basketball too. I don't think um, it's just, it's going to be so hard. Like once they're going to try for the sure. money, but um, once players start to come down with the coronavirus, it's not. I don't think it's going to last. So, uh, it, 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 it's probably a, a coin flip. Yeah. Uh, how much pain I think. Uh, the organizations are willing mm -hmm. to put up with. yeah it's a, it's a tough situation for everybody but yeah thanks so much for sharing that poem John good to hear from you sure but, bye. take care okay so um, let's see who will we do next let's do um, let's do this 256 number always fun getting a mystery poet from the phone Telephone is ringing. Hey, Jared, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem? I did. I and, do. Excuse me. <laughs> and, and, and what's your, your full name and, uh, and where are you calling from so I can try to find it? Oh, that's Jared Lacey, and I'm calling from Huntsville, Alabama. Ah, cool. Yeah, you've done it before. Thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, not a problem. Um, let's see. So Submittable is trying to find your poem, which I assume you submitted. Let's see. I did. Uh, it is entitled Still This House. Um, let's see. How do you spell Lacey? L A C Y. Oh, L A C Y. I had an E in there. Okay. Here we go. So, what is your poem about as I pull it up? Okay. Uh, it's just a response to a, a brief article that. Uh, uh, that, that, that basically uh, indicated that a former uh, New York City mayor uh, claimed that uh, BLM and other organizations were going to, you know, take people's homes or get rid of the police, you know, and, and release prisoners. <laughs> it is, it's just a, pretty much a, a, a testimony to how, you know, sensationalism and I guess say propaganda and fear mongering can be, you know, dangerous and daft. Uh, the first, there's three lines in it. Uh, let's see, line one, ten, eleven, pretty much re responds to him. And the poem uh, is also it's also merged with a, a personal um, matter that's going on with a member in our, in our family, and that's, and that's basically how that came about. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's hear it. It's all it's on screen all for right. everybody to see right about now. All right. Uh, this is still this house. Heaven, you won't like it. It's full of diversity, Boomer, old breeder. Almost two weeks ago. My mother told me that the vision in her right eye is barred by a brownish orange spot at the base of it. The fast active acid that is her panic that I somewhat adopted, I'm sorry to say, elected to accelerate time and made it to the worst possible outcome I really didn't want to consider. Real power is right here, baby. Watch what you do with it. A horrible case of the rawest inner blemish regulated an image of the woman who pushed me out into the world. The woman who laughs too loud. The woman that plays no games when it comes to children. The woman who is scheme driven by survival. The woman that I tried to decode all my life. The woman who waited until I was the age of men that should have several pairs of plaid shorts for spring and summer in their wardrobe. Tell me that the man who was my father died last year without me ever meeting him. The woman that, yes, I love, is actually forced to watch clock hands. Clocks. Whew. Child, that was a lot. My sister came to mind that I helped raise, that I loved too, and known as another cat that pisses on poles, claim posts and territories as not hers, spouts what her entitlement is if our head of household doesn't live. She's not that fool, though. You're beating me on my back with the long, dead, and errant bones of that old henchman Goebbels. Okay. 
she's a little sixes and seven, but she's not so sawed off upstairs where she couldn't figure how to drive a vehicle, tally her coins and know the importance of them, fire up some weed, be on or off point when she screams, or be manipulative. Mama, mama, I guess I don't know. Mama, I don't know at all. The mom, I fail too. I won't be a part of some internecine strain battling to accumulate other people's things. I'm going after quietude. I will make it art. I can lie down. I can get on the ground, be the style, something like Bruce Nauman, or what is equal to my skin color, where seeds can incubate and leap up slowly and not lie and say that I demanded people to know me. That is doing something, right? I mean, the lady with a king-sized bed and a Bible is troubled by something that's close to her brain, and she has yet to claim that these are our last days, despite being scared for her own few distant numbers, possibly. Will them doctors get it right? I don't trust them. If Christ is white, where are the whites Christ like? She's built in the power of Tupman and Fannie Lou's spirit, I think, but true to the whole strength of a gun. Many women have been called a bitch for less. Hell, I called her one. But in my head, angry, barely pushing, and scrubbed it fast in case her intuition was looking. That was still this house. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks so much. That was a great, great poem. I love the leaps there. And it's a great poem to listen to. So I'm glad you could call in and read it. Thanks so much. Thank you too, Tim. You have a good day, okay? You too. Yeah, that was Jared Lacey once again reading, uh, reading Steal This House. So thanks so much, Jared. And uh, talk to you soon. Okay, uh, let's see. Who should be up next? Um, are we still rolling? Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure things are still working. Checking out in the chat window. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's the YouTube chat. Is the YouTube chat working for everybody? I'm not seeing it myself. I think it might be a, something wrong with uh, YouTube. But I think the stream's working. We got we got 20 viewers going. And then we have, uh, yeah, 30 over on Facebook. Anyway, okay, let's go to the next caller. Um, and it'll be Ilari Pass. I hope I'm saying that right. Let's call up Ilari. Hey, Larry, I hear myself in the background, so cl click out of that, if you would, please. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I just turned it down. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you good now. You're good to go. I don't see it yet, though, so if you want to be on screen, click the little camera icon. There you come. See me now? Hi. I do now. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I hope you are. I'm doing great. And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Greensboro, North Carolina. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And did I say your name right? Is it Olari? Uh, yes. Great. Okay. And uh, and what poem did you want to share today? And what's it about? Um, well, it's a tribute to George Floyd. And the name of the um, poem is called Passage. Mm -hmm. So it, it, well, it's more than about George Floyd. Um about maybe about two weeks ago, I was watching a, a news footage um, about a young boy who was playing basketball in his own driveway, and his father videotaped the footage of um, a police patrolman driving in his car, passed by the house, and um, the boy hid behind his father's car. Oh, man. His father's car. So it, 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 just, it was just such a powerful thing to watch and I mean I think about my own son who's a teenager and with everything that's going on um you know it just broke my heart watching that yeah footage. yeah that's heartbreaking and it really is yeah so um so that that was the reason why I wrote this poem okay well I'll go ahead and share it whenever you're ready okay great um passage uh for George Floyd a boy on his bicycle rides up towards some men. 
holding one man down to the ground. Screams ring. He comes down hard, scraping his knee. Bystanders witness and shout in the sunshine. In the dark, the boy's father is at a picnic. He records whatever he can capture. Then he turns the volume up. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's spread out on the ground like broken glass. He stares at the boy in tears, running away from the crowd. His last black breath, the man pressing stay down, makes no sound. Someone releasing air by the knee where this man's life had once flown. Yeah, powerful poem. Thanks so much. Once again, that was Passage by Olari... Um... Larry Pass. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that and, and, and reading it and, and sharing that story with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Bye. you too. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Um, who should we do next? Let's call up Angela Gardner. And she sent a new version of her poem. I saw that. Hey, Angela, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Glad to see you. Um, what do you have for us this Sunday? Well, I I wrote a poem about um, I I was a former um, beat reporter, a, a journalist at a daily, mm -hmm. and um, I poem like this week was the uh, Capital Gazette newsroom shooting. Um, it was the two year anniversary of that, mm -hmm. where five uh, news employees were killed, and I was just thinking. You know, our job as journalists are so hard because, you know, we're trying, especially now, There, I feel like there's so much hatred for journalists and photojournalists and mm -hmm. for them to do their job. So I was just kind of thinking about that and, and thinking about how dangerous of a job journalists has become even more so in, in recent years. So Yeah, you, you said you're a former journalist. Is that, do you, do you no longer do that anymore? I'm a I'm a um, magazine editor now. Uh, I'm okay. a but I'm not a daily uh -huh. feature. Where, I hear you. you know, yeah, the, job, yeah. The pressure, the pressure on the and the news industry though for for headlines and and viral things and content, content, content. I mean, it, it's just a hard time to do real journalism. I think. Yeah, I mean, I consider myself still a journalist because I still write as a magazine editor, but it's not. It's it's different than the Daily Beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would love to. I would love to be on a beat, but you know, my job is a little easier right now. I mm -hmm. feel like, but so I just kind of took it from. I mean, I used to cover pro some. I mean, I covered a postal protest, a, a post office protesting, and I covered um, teachers protesting a, a certain bill that was going on, but never like what I've seen in the past recent years. So mm -hmm. that's why I just as a, I wrote this kind of as a journalist and what I've seen. But um, but I I haven't gone through you know I haven't gone through what they've gone through. Yeah. So I was thinking about them. Okay. So well, go and ahead. Too, yeah. not just but photojournalists mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Well, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Go. Um, it's tireless beat, so it's go out and cover this. Don't forget your phone, extra camera lens, pen, and reporter's notebook. Do you have a mask, some liquid for the possible mace and tear gas? Make sure people can see your press credentials. Do you have a bulletproof vest? When you get there, nervousness fills your body. A bit of excitement too. You wanna to tell the story, cautiously scanning the crowd. You remember the hurtful words in your head. You're scum, fake, and you don't deserve to live. It's those comments on your story, social media feeds. People who want to see your life turned upside down because you didn't write within their political bounds. Those readers don't care about your feelings or that your family is waiting for you to come home. And every day you do your job, your safety gets compromised and that you're not in it for the fame and there's no glory or promises of a real living wage. It's a passion and commitment. You put your whole heart in without needing praise. You pay no mind to the trolls who live under the broken bridges of hate. It's not done. You can't quit yet. You dismiss the critics to tell the stories of the oppressed and the emotional pleas during times of turbulence and difficulties. You write the truth of the days and moments we are all experiencing. 
reporting the verified facts, even if some won't believe. Thanks so much. And then that was Angela Gartner reading uh, Tireless Beats. And that's something, you know, it's, it's just, it's cool to get different perspectives. And I've never, I can't remember ever reading a poem from the perspective of a, of a beat reporter covering things like that. Yeah. And I do, and, you know, once you mention it, let, like you see the the people with the helmets and it's the press in the middle of really dangerous situations, hoping, you know, like in the middle of, um, you know, dangerous stuff that's going on, hoping people will read press and not, it's just amazing to me, especially in like, you know, during civil wars in foreign countries and stuff. It's amazing what the, the risks people take to get to get news. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's been going on for a long time and, you know, and people cover it, you know, out of this country. I mean, I think Hemington, Hemingway, right? He covered things and, you know, like there's been war journalists. And I feel like even in the United States in the past year, it feels like it feels like we're at war and these, I mean, if you just look at the news coverage and how many journalists are in the middle of these protests and these, and things going on, it's, it's, I, 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 I just, I feel journalism is so important and, and there's a lot of great journalists out there that, you know, are trying to really tell this story. That's all we're trying to do is tell the story of what we see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing that and calling in today, Angela. Okay, thanks for having me again. Yeah, Have my a great... pleasure. You too. Bye. Okay, um, let's see. So that was Angela Gardner reading Tireless Beats. Uh, let's go to, let's do another random phone call. I think, um, let's see, we'll do the 281 number, see who that is. I should write down, I think there's a way that I can make a phone book. I should do that so I know who I'm calling sometimes. But let's see who this is. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem today? Hi, Tim. Yeah, it's Kathy Gibbons calling from Houston, and I'd love to share a poem today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kathy. How are you doing today? I'm okay, and some wonderful work's being shared today. Yeah, they really. It's a good week for poetry. It's, there's been a lot of really great stuff, um, both in the submissions I got to read, what we got to publish, and what people are sharing today. So so what do you have for us? Uh, what are you going to well, write about? Well, I, I have one that I just emailed to you this morning. Um, it's a couple years old again, and um, but I thought it was relevant to life today, and it's called When a Wasp Stung a Lady on the Circle Line. Yeah, I have it here, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the Circle Line um, is a kind of a tourist boat, I guess, that circles around the island of Manhattan, and it, I think it goes under something like 26 bridges in the city, and it's usually jam-packed with folks, and mm -hmm. so this is a poem from a couple years ago when crowds were allowed, basically. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I've never been, I've never been on there. It sounds, sounds like fun, actually, except for you know, now with crowds. <laughs> but, right, and, it, and um, I set a picture along with it, and it was a photo I took the day this incident happened. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll show that, too. Okay. When a wasp stung a lady on the circle line. How lovely it is to see the other passengers jump to her attention, bearing ice, bearing Benadryl, bearing tissues and advice. So kind, so very nice. A small moment in a big crowd on this moistened, sun-fired day, circling the city, circling the history, circling the lives that came before, that came ashore. As we sail past Ellis Isle and Lady Liberty, her small dark hand is watched by caring man who checks for swelling, caring eyes of all aboard, caring strangers on a boat, huddled masses, hope-filled float together. The multicolored manifest converge, emerge as one. Perhaps it is still possible that we shall overcome. Thanks so much. That was Kathy Gibbons sharing one of Wasp Stung, A Lady on the Circle Line. Thanks so much Thank for sharing you. that, Kathy. Always a pleasure okay. to hear from you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Let's see. Let's go to Chris Kleinfelter. I think he was on last week. Let's see if he... It's ringing. Hmm. 
Chris is not answering. Nope. Oh. There he is. There he is. <laughs> Hi there. Hey, Chris. I got a. Let's see. Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. I don't have uh, your video yet. If you want to click on the camera button. Okay, I'm trying to trying to get there. Let's see. Yes, please. Well, um. What poem did you want to share today? I want to share a poem uh, called Life of Gain. Okay. Is that it? Did, did you send it in to me? I'm, not, I'm having trouble finding it. Yeah, I did. Uh, I emailed it in. Okay. Um, oh, you're ready. Okay. I see you. I see you here. Life of Gain. Okay. Okay. Ah, and there you are, Chris. Good, good to yes. see you. Right. Okay. So I originally I, I wrote this poem and appended it to an essay uh, that kind of expressed some feelings about uh, living in a more or less remote community. I live on the the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, and so I'm about eighty miles away from Washington from Seattle, and all the strange events that went on there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this was kind of what I was thinking about as the as the world around me seemed to be uh, trying to dismantle itself a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we're getting back to some normalcy, but so many things will have changed. So this is a life of gain. Waking up in the morning is no small miracle. What if I didn't? Waking up to who I am is my most important job. I must get it done. Waking up to other people is a blessing. I will seek it. I must not be blind to the struggles of this world, but I look around at all we have and know that the good life is ours to lose. Hey, thanks so much for sharing that. It was Chris Kleinfelter, or Klein, yeah, Kleinfelter. Kleinfelter, yes. Poem, Life of Gain from the uh, Olympic Peninsula. Thanks so much for joining us and sharing that today, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so we're trying to move through quick. We only have a few minutes left, and we got a bunch of people still uh, lined up. Let me see. I guess we kind of we'll call this like a lightning round. Um, this call. Let's try the uh, eight oh five number. See who that was. Phone is ringing to an eight oh five. Hey, this is Tim with Red. Do you want to share a poem? Hey, Dan Mask. Oh, hey, Dan. How you doing? I'm good. Let me turn you off there. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, so, so where are you calling from again? I can't remember. Charlotte, North Carolina. Ah, uh, that's right. And how are you doing today? About 90. Well, not too far from Greensboro. I'm that last caller. Oh, yeah. I'm doing great. I always, I really love what you're doing. It's really got me motivated, which I really needed. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to hear that. That's the whole point of what we do is just to try to get everybody motivated to write poems. Because I think it makes your life better when you write, just explore the world through, through language like that. So um, just art, I, any art I in general. Sure. But. Well, I, I think it also pulls a lot of stuff out of me, you know, what, you know, what I believe and um, what I care about. And uh, that's what this, this poem is about, the... Um, my pet ghost. I send it in to you. Yeah, I have it here. Um, uh, let me pull it up. Yep, oh, I'm ready to go. So whenever you're ready, uh, if you want to say anything about what it's about first. Yeah, I mean, that, for me, I, when I look at these articles, I look at a lot of stuff online, and uh, it was a clip about this fish kill, about the about the starfish is uh, dying on Myrtle Beach, and um, and then we took a walk in a cemetery earlier, and we had conversations about ghosts. And why are white? Why are ghosts always white you know, <laughs> in culture? And so you come back, and, and I pull all this stuff together, you know, and uh, it, it turns into a poem. So it's it's never about one thing with me. It's always like an amalgam of things that come together. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, finding the way things are related is a lot of what poetry is about. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think been thinking a lot about color, and uh, curious about my own color beliefs and my belief systems about color and, you know, and um, the, the metaphor 
the physical aspect of the starfish turning into a hand <laughs> that that's what really was the um the the seed of this poem and that's how it all got started yeah. anyway okay. here it is yeah let's hear it my my pet ghost i could say right away that i believe in ghosts or maybe my brain adds details that aren't there my pet ghost starfishes her white hand in my face for attention open shut open shut she tapped me on the shoulder one day and, and came home with me listening to her beyond the rigid rectangle of the door frame i learned secrets like why are baby chicks dyed pink for easter and why do people consider white a color my skin knows her world thanks so much that was my pet ghost by dan mask yeah. from charlotte north carolina thanks. thanks so much for sharing that dan you're the best thanks buddy yeah my pleasure have a good rest of your day you too bye Okay, we have time for one more. Sorry if we don't get to you. There's just there's way too many people uh, on the list today, which is always fun to see. So thanks for thanks for doing that and, and wanting to participate. Um, let's do. Let's see. Um, who would be next? I haven't gotten to yet. There's a two o three. Let's do a two o three. We'll close it out with this. Telephone's ringing. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Who am I talking to? Uh, Celine Mariotti. Hey, Celine. How are you doing today? Oh, doing fine. And uh, uh, I thought I'd read my poem about Fourth of July. Okay, sure. Um, how? I sent it to you. I think Tuesday. Okay, uh, I'll find it. Let's see. Fourth of July or Independence Day. Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to come up. But um, so it's a Fourth of July poem, huh? Is, is there anything yeah. else you want to say about it? Fourth of July, our Independence Day. Well, it's all, all about uh, our country and a great country we have, and I mention all the wonderful things that there are to see across the country. And I mention my dad and uncles who fought for this country, and it's, it's a pretty long poem. <laughs> okay, well, why don't you dive right in? It's ready. Okay. Fourth of July, our Independence Day. In 1776, we declared our independence. Thomas Jefferson, a gifted writer, statesman, and inventor, penned the words to our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. George Washington was our general leading us to victory over the British in our Revolutionary War, and we became our own country, independent and separate from England. George Washington, that great general, was our first elected president, and he was a very good president. Every American should go see his home in Mount Vernon. He was a humble man and a quiet man. He always said, friends with all and friends with none. As in life, no one is ever really your best friend. Betsy Ross sewed our first flag. Anyone who goes to Philadelphia should go see her house. Every American at some time in their life should visit our capital, Washington, D.C. Go visit the Capitol building where in the rotunda there are many statues of all our founding fathers and the three women who fought for women's rights. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott. They made sure a woman got the right to vote and to own her own property and fight for custody of her own children. Always remember the men who fought for this country, whether it was the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the First Gulf War, and the Second Gulf War and all the men who are still over there defending our country against the terrorists. Go see the Senate and House debate. Go see the White House, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Korean Memorial, where 19 statues of the soldiers marching through the fields with their backpacks and radios stand so lifelike. We went to see it with my dad. He was, he was a Korean War veteran. 
and always talked about the war. He was wounded in Tegu, and he and another fellow, the only two in their unit to survive. My dad, Peter Mariani, was awarded the Purple Heart. Go see the Roosevelt Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, where many people leave photos and notes and flowers to the soldiers who died. Go see the World War II Memorial, which pays homage to all the men who died in that war. Both my Uncle Dominic and my Uncle Tony fought in World War II. My uncle was taken prisoner at the Battle of the Bulge. He escaped the prison camp after six months of captivity and followed the sound of the American artillery and got back to the American lines. He was a hero, but he didn't receive the Bronze Star until 1998, over 50 years later. Uncle Tony was in the ordinance as he was a mechanic at the end of the war he was among the soldiers who freed the Jewish people who were in those concentration camps. Uncle Tony said it was such a horror to see what those people had suffered. America may have its faults, and we've had some hard times, and we're living through very difficult times. But as my grandfather, Frank Ainotti, who was an Italian immigrant, always said, this is the best country in the world. God bless America. Thanks so much for sharing that once again. That was Celine Mariotti uh, with her poem uh, for this week. Um, Fourth of July, our Independence Day, a journey through through history and, and your your own family history. So thanks so much for sharing that, Celine. It was always good to hear from you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, that is the show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry to the people we did not get to. There are a whole bunch of phone calls, um, but I, I got to get going back to work. Uh, not that this isn't work. I guess it's, this is work, too, technically. Um, but thanks so much for sharing all your, your poems to this week. Now, um, um, I should say this week's guest coming up on the Rattlecast, oops, there we go, is uh, Carrie Gunter Seymour in her book, A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, July 7th. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Carrie is, uh, was just named Poet Laureate of Ohio and um, just like two weeks ago. So congratulations to Carrie on that. We'll be one of the first people to talk to her as Poet Laureate of Ohio. So that's really cool. Um, and also I should say the Rattle Poetry Prize is coming up, of course, deadline July 15th. The entry fee is just a subscription to Rattle, 25 bucks. Everybody watching probably already knows about it. But if you don't, this is sort of our subscription drive that we do every year um, for people who want a subscription anyway. It's a great reminder to, to subscribe and renew your submission or subscriptions. And um, to get that a chance at that fifteen thousand dollar first prize, the runner up this year is five thousand dollars. I think it's twenty five thousand in total prizes amongst eleven winners. That's how we're going to do it. So, um, you know, it, all it is is to subscribe as you submit up to four poems. So please do that if you haven't yet. Uh, you have about two weeks or less than that, ten days. So get those poems ready. And um, in the meantime, I will see you on Tuesday, July seventh, uh, nine p.m. Eastern, for Carrie. Gunter Seymour. Uh, have a good one. Good day.